Great. All right, and we're ready to go live. Fantastic. Um, well, I'm happy to welcome everyone to our June 17th meeting of the Historic Preservation and Cultural Resource Commission special meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. Um, and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, to keep things streamlined, I'll go ahead and lead that. Um, so if everyone will please rise. Mm. <laughs> the logistics. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can stay in this. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic to which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, now we'll go with roll call. Roll call. Chair Lubisich? Present. Commissioner Acosta? Present. Commissioner Moharo? Present. Commissioner Weeks? Present. All right. Tonight's meeting is live streamed on Cable Channel 3 and on our online platforms. Please email all public comments to, and it's a fun email address, hpcrc public comment, as one word, at sgch.org, no later than the time the item is considered by the Historic Preservation and Cultural Resource Commission tonight. Comments received after items have been considered will not be read into the record. Comments will be read by Assistant Erica Ortiz for up to three minutes each. To prevent any overlaps in comments, each commissioner will be called upon to speak. So our first item tonight is the public comment. And if um, Assistant Ortiz would please read the following. This is a time set aside, set aside for members of the public to address the Historic Preservation and Cultural Resource Commission on items of interest that are not on the agenda, but are subject within the subject matter jurisdiction of the commission. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the commission cannot answer any questions or take any action until such time as the matter may appear as an item on a future agenda. So do we have any public comments that have been received? No, Chair, we don't have any public comments. If it's all right with the group, I'd like to pause just a moment in the event that somebody might be sending something, um, since we do have a delay with the uh, live stream. All right, uh, then let's move on to approval of minutes. These are the minutes from the March 11th, 2020 uh, HPCRC meeting. Um, I would hope that my fellow commissioners have had a chance to review the minutes. Are there uh, any, any discussion, correction, addition to the minutes? No. Um, if I could get a motion then to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Thank you, Angela. And a second? Second. From Eric, thank you. Um, so all those in favor, say aye. 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 I'll take a roll call vote here. Oh, thank you, Erica. Commissioner Acosta? Yes. Commissioner Weeks? Yes. Commissioner Maharo? Yes. Chair Lubisage? Yes. Motion passed, vote is four zero. All right, so then our next item is number three, the San Gabriel Great Streets Project planning case number HIST 20-001. Applicant is the city of San Gabriel and our presentation will be made by management specialist, Mark Gallatin. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and welcome to the commissioners. I wanna uh, extend a welcome and, and it's a pleasure to meet all of you virtually uh, for the first time. 
Uh, tonight, I have an item for you, which you received a staff report uh, last week on, and which we have a short PowerPoint presentation. So if I could ask if we could see slide one, please. And uh, this is a project located in the alley between Santa Anita Avenue and McGroarty Street. It is immediately north of the City Hall parking lot. And it's, it is uh, being done in conjunction with the San Gabriel Great Streets project. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. The Great Streets project is part of a uh, public works project to repair, uh, resurface or reconstruct uh, alleys and streets throughout San Gabriel. Uh, on this particular site, on April 3rd of this year, construction crews were excavating the alley and found some bones underneath the asphalt. Uh, the city immediately stopped the work and contacted Dr. John Dietler from SWCA Environmental Consultants. Uh, Dr. Dietler and his associate, Aaron Elzinga, are here tonight as well uh, to answer any questions uh, regarding their work that the commission may have. Uh, following that uh, initial contact, Dr. Dietler, along with Anthony Morales and Adrian Morales of the Gabrielino Tongva San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians, visited the location on April 15th. They took photographs, collected uh, animal bones, and several glass bottle fragments. They also observed one or more mission period architectural features, along with American period historic artifacts. Uh, this area where the alley is loca located today uh, is believed to be the area where the mission's Native American apartments were constructed back in 1807 and 08 and have been mapped in that general area. So this is an area that's particularly sensitive for discovery of mission period and Native American materials. Now, uh, upon their initial uh, visit to the site, as required by our municipal code, construction activity was diverted within 25 feet of any vis visible archeological materials. Uh, this includes the center of the alley where it turns at a right angle. Uh, the alley runs south from Santa Anita Avenue uh, and then makes a right turn and heads west exiting on McGroarty Street. Uh, and the uh, brick and cement foundations that were found in area west and south for a minimum of 100 feet uh, were uh, quarantined or diverted from construction activity. Next slide, please. Now, what is the process for the identification, documentation, and management of archaeological, Native American, or paleontological resources that are discovered in San Gabriel. Well, this is actually governed by our municipal code. This is a section out of our cultural resource and historic preservation ordinance that was adopted in 2017. And basically it uh, sets up a three phase process for uh, determining potential impacts to these sort of resources. The first phase or phase one is the identification of potential significant cultural resources. Phase two is the evaluation of those resources significance. And phase three, where necessary and appropriate, is the mitigation of substantial adverse impacts through data recovery salvage by qualified professionals. If we could have the next slide, please. So in this case, uh, a phase one report was requested from SWCA and was prepared on April 19th which provided an initial analysis of the discovery and confirmed that the bones found were not human, but were in fact of cows, sheep, goats, and other small mammals. Based on the findings initially in the phase one report, the city then commissioned the phase two report, which was provided to us on June the 2nd. And in that report, uh, the identified features were found to be significant. They should be considered significant and a historical resource under both uh, the cultural, uh, I'm sorry, the California Register of Historic Resources or the San Gabriel Register of Cultural Resources. And then subsequent to that, uh, we commissioned a phase three report uh, and that was delivered to us on June the 10th. In that phase three report, over 400 
unique and individual artifacts were identified in association with three of the four newly identified features. Mitigation conditions were also recommended for the project in order to preserve any known or identified uh, resources. Next slide, please. The cultural resources assessment resulted in the identification and recordation of four features within the project footprint. And we have photographs of each of those features. This slide shows uh, feature one, which is uh, ladrillo tile floor and foundation. Now, ladrillo is a form of brick that was used back in the, in the mission era uh, for construction of uh, both uh, flooring and buildings. Um, and that is what uh, you see in the, in the photograph here in the center of the slide. Next slide, please. Feature two is a cobble and mortar subfloor with a circular ladrillo tile section. Next slide, please. Feature three is a ladrillo tile floor and foundation. Next slide. And feature four is another ladrillo tile foundation. We could have the next slide, please. So I've summarized the, the process by which the uh, discovery is uh, analyzed and recorded uh, in the phase one, two, and three reports. Uh, let's talk for a minute about the role of this commission in reviewing those findings. Again, referring back to our Historic Preservation and Cultural Resource Ordinance, it requires that the Community Development Director refer these sort of reports to the Commission for consideration at their next available meeting, and, and hence that's why it's on tonight's agenda. The Commission, in reviewing the project, is charged with evaluating the report and incorporating mitigation conditions for the project in order to preserve any of the known or identified significant archaeological Native American or paleontological resources. And you'll recall from a few slides ago that the phase two report determined that these discoveries were significant. Then uh, <clears throat> those conditions that are adopted by the commission are then forwarded to the building and safety division and they get enforced in accordance with the requirements in state law for a mitigation and monitoring program. Next slide, please. So here you see four bullet points, and these are the four recommended mitigation conditions uh, that SWCA has drafted for us. Uh, the first one being uh, a recommendation to complete updates to the San Gabriel Archaeological Site and the San Gabriel Civic Center Historic District and resource records. Second recommendation is to have a qualified archaeologist initiate data recovery procedures to mitigate project impacts that have already taken place and any additional impacts that may come along with the completion of the planned work. Uh, this work should be guided by a formal research design. Third recommendation is to create and implement a plan to protect the significant features and artifacts in situ to the extent possible after data recovery is complete. <clears throat> and the fourth recommendation is that any additional ground disturbing work within the alley portion of the project area be monitored by a Native American and qualified archaeologist to avoid impacts uh, to the features discussed in the report and any others that as of yet have not been encountered. Uh, if human remains are encountered, then protocols are in place uh, that should be followed in accordance with state and federal law on the discovery of human remains. Next slide, please. We want to talk a, a minute about environmental review under CEQA. Now, an alley reconstruction project <clears throat> or a street rehabilitation project, uh, these are the sort of projects that typically get an exemption, what's called a categorical exemption from CEQA uh, as having de minimis or, or no uh, severe adverse impacts on the environment. But of course, uh, that's not the case here. This is not the typical alley reconstruction project because of the location and because of the presence of the, of the uh, Native American and ar archeological resources. So that's why CEQA says that a categorical exemption shall not be used for a project which may cause a substantial adverse change 
and the significance of a historical resource. <coughs> Excuse me. The second bullet point goes on to say that um, impacts that adversely affect the significance of a resource that's eligible or listed in the California Register are considered a significant effect on the environment. Impacts to resources from the project that are considered significant if the are considered significant if the project physically destroys or damages all or part of the resources, changes the character of the use of the resource or physical feature within the setting of the resource, which contribute to its significance or introduces visual, atmospheric, or audible elements that diminish the integrity of significant features of the resource. Now, the alleyway in which the work took place is itself a National Register of Historic Places and California Register of Historic Resources eligible resource. And it is also a contributor to the San Gabriel Civic Center Historic District. Uh, and it is finally also within the boundaries of the San Gabriel uh, Mission District. Because it was determined eligible for listing in those registers, it is a historical resource as defined by CEQA, which requires the identification and mitigation of substantial adverse impacts that might affect these eligible resources. And this comes back to what we talked about on the last slide and the responsibility of the commission to uh, adopt mitigation conditions. And so uh, accordingly, mitigation conditions uh, have been developed, uh, which I covered a moment ago uh, from SWCA. If we could have the next slide, please. So again, staff's recommendation in this case is that the commission evaluate the archeological report associated with the San Gabriel Great Streets project, that the commission determine that the proposed project will not significantly affect the cultural resource and that it can be documented and left in situ without compromising the integrity of the cultural resource and that it incorporate mitigation conditions for the project in order to preserve any known or identify significant archeological or Native American resources. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, I know we covered a lot and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm going to just call by name to ask for any clarifying questions. So Commissioner Acosta, do you have any questions for uh, Mark Gallatin or for the archaeological team? Um, yes, I think the, the first thing, and I did a little bit of research, but I just want to hear it from them. So when it is um, documented that it could be left in C2, I just want to understand the technicality um, of that term. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, in C2 means in site or uh, in place. Of where it's currently located, um, I'll probably ask Dr. Dietler to address your uh, your question directly, uh, based on his many years of experience with dealing with resources that are preserved in situ. Thank you, uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, Mark added right that the idea would be to leave as much as possible of the remains in place and. Um, while completing the project, hopefully cover them with protective materials or use some other engineering method to ensure their long-term preservation. Um, the two major uh, goals of the mitigation recommendations that you just heard about would be to learn what we can at this time, now that the materials have been exposed and impacted by the project, and then do no further harm by safely covering them up, uh, allowing the um, alleyway to be uh, the planned work to be completed while doing as little harm as possible with the uh, archaeological features. Um, there's two major kinds of archaeological materials that one uncovers, uh, one being artifacts, which are by definition portable. One can pick them up and put them in a museum. The other being features, which are by definition fixed in place. And if you were to pick them up and move them, let's imagine a brick floor, pick it up and move it, and it's no longer a floor, it's a pile of bricks. So the uh, preference is to preserve them in place. Okay, and then uh, thank you. That that was really great. Thank you, John. 
and then as a follow-up, if uh, obviously uh, preserving preserving it as a feature and making sure that it doesn't become the the said pile of bricks, then what are the steps after that? You know, for example, can I walk with my kid over there and take a look at it once everything is completed? Like, what exactly would be um, the the I guess the, the the pros and the cons, and and then just understanding the the subsequent steps after that. Well, again, uh, John, maybe you want to address that, and uh, maybe there are parallels here between the work that was done on the Alameda Corridor East project and the uh, the opportunities for viewing and things like that, um, and this project. Yeah, I think the uh, city has some options here. The um, one option would be to protect in place and cover with a plain alleyway and not have the materials be visible or marked to the public. Um, another option would be to use signage and say, here lies these features and interpret them a bit. Um, a third option still might be to allow some part of the features to be visible um, through the pavement. And there are techniques to do that with um, uh, transparent coverings or uh, incorporating materials that perhaps mimic the look of the feature. Interestingly, the reason that this was already listed as a historical resource is because one of these features, our feature one, was visible through a worn spot in the pavement for years. Um, it was reported by my team back in 2009 and uh, was visible, but, but it wasn't marked and people didn't know precisely what it was until we had this better look at it. So um, there is an opportunity here if the city wishes to incorporate some preservation. Um, like we did with the uh, Chapman's Mill Race uh, on the other side of City Hall in the park um, in front of the Mission Church. Um, uh, one consideration of which way to go with this is um, public safety and whether this is a place you want to um, attract pedestrians. So um, there are some preserved in place elements of the mission site uh, on Main Street south of the Alameda Corridor East Trench that the city chose not to mark um, because they, they felt it would be unsafe to attract uh, pedestrians over to that portion of the city. Um, so you really have both options before you here, but um, I think adding, we will learn something here. We already have learned something. The idea if these mitigation measures are adopted would be that we will learn more. And um, it would, I would argue, would do the greatest public good to um, allow the public to learn as well. Commissioner Acosta, do you have any further questions? Not seeing much. Um, hope she can still hear us. It looks like maybe her, her feed stalled a little bit. Um, Commissioner Weeks, do you have any um, clarifying questions that you'd like to ask? I don't know if, uh, if it's so much a question, but <clears throat> it seems to me that this uh, these tile foundations that have been found uh, are, are pretty unique. Uh, the the option to to cover them with some sort of a transparent uh, element that leaves them open to uh, to view, I think, is probably a uh, attributed to uh, to this artifact. I mean, if this is a uh, native uh, apartment location, that's what the thought is. These are foundations to these native apartments. And I don't believe that there's anything in this whole uh, uh, the mission site that references that type of a structure, is there? Uh, that's correct. The um, mission was a very large property, much bigger than it is now when it was active back in the 17 and 1800s, and um, had residential facilities, agricultural workshops, uh, obviously worship facilities in the church itself. What remains today is really just the uh, church and the few elements of the workshops that are just immediately north of it and for interpreted um, when folks take tours there. Um, the residential areas for the Native Americans were um, away from that core area that we think one of them was here and are not currently um, visible. In fact, weren't even known where the precise location was until this project. So this is absolutely unique for um, this mission site. And because the mission was at its heart, a Native American town, it happened to be run by a handful of priests and soldiers, but it was a Native American town. 
um, marking and interpreting the place where those residents lived would be a really important part of the story. Yes, I, I agree. I think the, the challenge there would be to balance the <clears throat> marking of this, this location and showing uh, the history of it and yet balance off the, the use of that uh, dry aisle as, uh, you know, uh, voting for the uh, <clears throat> um, uh, the retail facilities. Those are the back of uh, a lot of the Nomad Pops and uh, mm -hmm. some of those other areas that are there of the uh, merchants. Uh, and uh, that's going to be, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how, how that might work. That's just a comment. So anyway, <clears throat> thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you. Angela, it looked like we lost you a little bit. Um, did you have any further questions? I moved on to Commissioner Weeks. No, thank you for doing that. Yes, it, it's just a uh, uh, hazard of, of, of the go-to meeting. But yes, I'm back and that completed. Thank you so much um, for answering those questions. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, so Commissioner Maharo, do you have any questions on this item? I, I do. I actually, uh, just one, this is this is the, the repavement of that alleyway. What is the depth of the excavation? The depth required to complete the project or the depth of the archaeological materials? Uh, uh, required to complete the project. Uh, perhaps Mark or Matt could answer that question. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Commissioner. I, I don't off the top of my head know that information. Um, I. It would be ideal if we had a representative from our public works department here tonight, uh, but uh, apparently they were not available. I would certainly be happy to, uh, you know, research that and, and get back to the commission on it. I, based on the markings that we can see um, with the incomplete work and the partially completed work to the northwest of the area of interest, it appears that they need to go down in some areas uh, as much as 18 inches and in some areas probably quite a little less. So from a practical point of view, it's the highest elements that remain of these features that might impede that. But if we incorporate a, um, a transparent, uh, perhaps thinner covering over those high spots, then maybe we um, get both benefits that you get the, vis the visibility and um, can modify the design of the project to prevent additional um, excavation or demolition of the features from being needed. Great. And I, I also thank you for that. I also agree with Eric Weeks that it, it should be, we should have some sort of um, a plaque or whatever, uh, just, you know, stating that this is, this is what occurred here. This is what was here, the, the Native American apartments. Um, and I think it's, it's important for any future walking tours, anything, anything to, to bring interest and, and a little more awareness to, to our community. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you for answering that. You're welcome. All right. So then I have several questions for you. Um, I think one of the features that I'm most intrigued by is feature four. Um, mm -hmm. You identified this is the one in terms of mitigation measures that uh, we can choose if we would like to do further work to better understand that feature. Mm -hmm. Is this the one um, uh, that we think might yield more information about the Native American population that lived in this area? Yes. So we have four numbered features, but we think there are probably three features and one of them was cut in half by later um, utility uh, work. So um, the, the biggest and most obvious features are um, thick but simple uh, brick floors, tiled floors. Um, those that's features one and three. Feature two is an interesting keyhole shaped um, structure that is surrounded by a, a heavy foundation of cobblestones that we think had a, a cooking or heating purpose. There are um, features like that that were used um, just north of the Mission Church that's still there for um, melting um, tallow and creating soap or uh, perhaps um, ironworking or um, even preparing food. So it appears to be the base of a cooking feature. The uh, fourth feature, though, is the one that we uh, discovered latest in our um, 
earlier work and had the least time to really uncover. Uh, and if it's the best candidate for being the foundations for the actual Native American apartments themselves. And in an ideal world, again, we, we had a, not enough time to really explore this fully, which is why additional work is needed. But in an ideal world, there will be uh, artifacts left behind by the Native Americans who live there that will tell us about their daily lives more than they lived in homes that were built by the missionaries. But here's what they did inside of those homes. Um, so that's, we know the least about it. And that's got the greatest potential for us to learn something we don't already know. And so then some of the artifacts that you listed, uh, like the, the bone all would be an indication of that, of we might find more, uh, more yeah. art artifacts yeah. along those lines. Yeah, artifacts of, uh, one would um, expect artifacts of daily life that from the Native American. So um, tools and um, food remains, um, elements of clothing, that sort of thing. Okay. So um, for me, excuse me, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. One of the opportunities that we have here from a research perspective is that that earlier project that Mark mentioned, the um, AC and Gabriel Trench project, uncovered a traditional Native American home, um, a brush hut, probably the same time period. It's not earlier. There, there were people living probably throughout the mission period in traditional brush huts. A um, kind of community improvement program that the missionaries embarked on was to put them all in, in um, constructed Spanish style housing. And so if we were to find artifacts associated with both styles of housing, we could ask questions about uh, were there differences? Were different kinds of people living in these things? Was their lifestyle, um, their quality of life different? The activities they undertook, that sort of thing. So it'd be a really important comparison that we could make. Okay. And so then I had also noticed in one of the maps that there's the extension of the boundary of this, this area. So these mm -hmm. finds in the alley are now pushing us further west in terms of our understanding of sort of the habitation site. Yeah, so the boundaries of the mission, because it's covered with your fine city, are difficult to map. You really, you can't map them until you find things. And the um, the state takes a conservative approach that uh, we could guess that it uh, covered a much larger area based on things like these historical photographs that were uh, paintings that is that you've seen and some of the early maps. But um, we basically don't map things as known to exist until we have evidence of them. And so every time we find something new, I would expect the site will um, continue to grow over the years uh, as additional finds are made. So the um, old boundary was right at the edge of the city parking lot. So this only extends it by a few feet to the north and west, but it does extend it. And I was flipping through the report. I lost uh, the page of the map that you had that had identified some sites that are under the city parking lot, um, the former yeah. boundary. So uh, see, it's on page 39 of your report. Um, so then these would have been features that you identified using ground penetrating radar or some other mechanism? No. Uh, oh, so no, those were um, uh, work associated with the San Gabriel Trench project. Um, okay did uh, there was work that happened during that era in the city parking lot and um it was fence work that I, perhaps the construction of the fence that's there right now it uh, happened late in the um a san gabriel trench project and that's when those features were encountered so we, we saw those in person during construction activities okay and then in terms of um as we're thinking about the the project continuing and how we mitigate the project um and we've talked about leaving these as something that could be seen or providing just simple signage for interpretation. Um, you had included a series of DPRs in your report. So is that the sort of documentation that would take place for features that would then no longer be visible? Or do you do that for everything that's taken from the site? Um, so the process is to record everything you find on those updated site forms. For a, a big and complex site like this, we might use less detail for if we find, well, we, we found hundreds and hundreds of features during the um, during the prior work uh, for the AC and Gabriel Trent project because that was such a massive project. But in this case, we would record these four features and have a summary of the artifacts that were found and the interpretations to add to the, the permanent record that the state keeps on file. Um, the purpose of those records is for um, both research and future planning purposes. So um, your successors at the city uh, several decades from now would be able to look those up if the city didn't have its own records and um, remind themselves about what was found here. So it's, but it's not accessible to the public. That is meant for um, uh, landowners and managers and archaeologists like myself. And um, if you're interested in interpreting and sharing some of this information with the public, that would be through other means. Right. 
Um, and in your opinion, um, I, I completely understand why you wouldn't want to be attracting people into a high traffic area, but are there other reasons why you would not choose to make these types of features visible or available to the public? Uh, in this case, no. I think um, often the answer would be yes to that question, but in this case, I think, um, I guess I have a, a few thoughts on the subject. Archaeological site location information is largely meant to be kept from the public because there is a risk that um, members of the public might go in the dark of night and dig holes and try to find treasures. In this case, because you're covering it with pavement, um, that seems less likely. Also, it's it's right near um, facilities where there's lots of foot traffic, and I think these are in a much more secure location. The public is also very well aware that the mission exists here. It's on your logo and it's well signed. So I don't think there's any mystery to keep from the public. Um, the only point of hesitation I might have is if the Native Americans were sensitive about the, um, the nature of the finds. To my knowledge, they're not, although certainly I would encourage you to uh, ask them. Um, but there are elements of this site that are of importance to the Native Americans that they do not want shared with the public. I suspect that this isn't one of them. But again, that's a, probably a good question to ask them. Aside from that, though, I, I don't have reasons to um, to prevent to to avoid uh, marking this site. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, so my fellow commissioners, um, I believe we need to take action on what we're going to recommend on this item. Um, so, I'm shuffling through binders. Madam uh, Chair, uh, Madam Chair, um, if yeah. we can just make sure there are no public comments oh, submitted. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, if there are any public comments on this agenda item, um, again, these can be emailed to hpcrc public comment at sgch.org. So we'll go ahead at 7.08. We can open the public comment period on this item. And this is. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, there is no public comment for this item. All right. Um, again, if you don't all mind, I'd like to wait just a moment, um, given the lag on, on YouTube as we stream this. All right, so it is now 7.09 and the time for public comment on this item is now closed. So um, for commission deliberation and discussion, I again will go through by name. Um, and uh, if you have any further comment you'd like to raise, um, please do so. So, Commissioner Acosta? Uh, no further comment. Commissioner Weeks? Um, I think I you know, based on our conversation we've been having about should these be visible to the public or not, uh, I think that should be explored. What would it cost to, to make them? Is it simple as just some signage, paving it over? Uh, I, I think the, the next step, I think, is to determine um, the best way to do that. Uh, this would be with a suggestion that maybe it, it possibly gets all covered over, doesn't uh, allow it to get uh, vandalized later on down. Um, I can understand that point of view. So maybe signage is all that we could put in there that would indicate what's buried below the pavement. Um, uh, the rest of the uh, artifacts, you know, buttons and tools and things like that can be collected and put in uh, on display. But th this is a this is a tricky uh, area. I, I, I hate to see the opportunity uh, be lost to somehow make this part of the mission experience. So. Those are my thoughts. Thank you. Commissioner Mahara. Um, I, have a, I have a question. There was there, there were multiple pieces that were found that were smaller fragments or whatnot. Um, those are currently stored somewhere, I suppose. 
Um, who decides where those are, are, are archived? Uh, they belong to the city um, and you decide, I would think, or someone at the city. Um, we uh, currently are holding them, but the um, recommendation would be uh, for curation and or display and curation means um, keeping those things that are significant. The uh, materials from that earlier project, the San Gabriel Trench project, um, the most significant materials, we found so many things that not everything ended up uh, in this one place, but the most significant materials are held by UCLA um, and in their Fowler Museum. Uh, for um, purposes of long-term preservation and future research. Uh, we had quite a few excess materials that were donated to um, local historical associations, school groups, and that sort of thing. Um, so the city has discretion on that front. Uh, we will, of course, make recommendations, but um, you have lots of options, including um, donation, local display within City Hall, let's imagine, um, uh, putting them in a research institution, that sort of thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I agree with Commissioner Weeks that I think we need more discussion about uh, how we interpret and mark um, and educate about this site. Um, so I think it's important that that be done in consultation with city staff, but also with representatives from our local tribes um, so that we're careful in honoring what they would like to have done. Um, I agree that I think it's one of the, the great marvels of San Gabriel that we do have active archaeological sites um, uh, in our literal backyard. Um, so it's it's certainly something that is is a, a, a wonderful part of being in, in San Gabriel. Um, and I, I think there's good reason to, to recognize and celebrate that. Um, so I'm wondering if it's possible to have um, the, the slide, I believe it's slide 10 from the presentation, but back up just so that we can see what the proposed mitigation measures are. Adam, if we could have slide number 10, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, I always will bank that there's a, a technical glitch before, uh, before that. All right, so um, these are the recommendations that came to our commission from SWCA. Um, what we need to do now is decide how we would like to go forward. Um, we have a recommendation um, from city staff as well about the course of action that we can take. Um, so for my fellow commissioners, do I have a motion of what you would like to, to do tonight? Uh, yeah, I think this is our uh, the, the third bullet point there, create and implement a plan to protect the features in place uh, after data recovery is complete. I think that uh, that should be on feature four, that, that should be our direction to maybe get some uh, proposals on uh, a signage plan, uh, some sort of a transparent cover, um, all these things we talked about, just for uh, budget considerations and, and practicality. All right. Um, so for that third point, um, that's one of the mitigation conditions that you think is particularly significant? Yes. All right. Are there any comments or things that uh, our other commissioners would like to emphasize? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, I was talking to myself. <laughs> uh, the, the only other thing is um, what, what we have already expressed, uh, this is an opportunity for us to learn right from our backyard. So anything that we can do to, to be able to do that um, as stated here and then um, 
what uh, Chair Lubitsch also said, that we should really also bring in um, the local tribe to make sure that we have their commentary, just reinforcement of that point as well. I agree. I agree with Angela, just as, um, as everyone else has stated, making sure that it's monitored by a representative of the, uh, the Native American tribe. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I, um, I will speak in favor of all four mitigation conditions that were presented by SWCI. I think that they lay a good um, foundation and process for uh, the best opportunity to understand um, what is there. Um, and so in terms of the recommendations going forward, um, perhaps staff can help me. Um, when we look at, um, at what we would then, in terms of our action take from here, um, is it then forwarding our recommendation to city council that we continue with uh, these four mitigation measures with data collection um, and then, uh, or any recovery procedures um, uh, in, in keeping with recognition that this is a historically significant site and that it merits um, the full protections of, of preservation? Well, in this case, Madam Chair, um, your commission is the deciders on this. There is, it's not, uh, in this case, you're not acting in an advisory role to the city council. So you have okay. the final say on this. From a practical standpoint, uh, if there's consensus, and it sounds like there is, uh, it might be simplest to just move adoption of the mitigation conditions as proposed. I do have a clarifying question though for the commission mm -hmm. and it relates to the third bullet point, uh, creating, the imp creating and implementing a plan uh, to protect the artifacts. Um, you know, for the city, it's a delicate balance of course, between uh, time and budget and wanting to do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis the, the um, the historic nature of these resources. Um, my concern that I raise is that <clears throat> if we are to work with uh, SWCA and our local Native American representatives to come up with a plan, would the commission be willing to have a special meeting to review that and comment on it rather than having to wait till your next regular meeting in September? I think based on um, the feedback that we would all like to see that level of consultation done uh, regarding this resource. Um, and I, I saw one commissioner nod his head. I don't have the, the full screen. Um, I certainly am willing to do that. Um, commissioner Acosta and Mahara, would you be amenable to a special meeting? Yes. Yes. All right. So that was, um, thank you, Mark, for the clarification. Uh -huh. um, and it, it was something that, that I was going to ask. Um, uh, in terms of creating that plan, how do we proceed? Um, so um, I guess then um, I would like a motion to adopt the, the four mitigation conditions that were proposed by SWCA with clarification um, that we will hold a special meeting uh, when, uh, when a, a plan is created um, for that preservation of the features um, to review and, and adopt that plan. Motion to adopt, yes. Okay, so that was Angela. Do I have a second? I'll second that. And Mojaro, so then uh, vote by roll call. Roll call vote, Commissioner Acosta? Yes. Commissioner Weeks? Yes. Commissioner Mojaro? Yes. Chair Lubisich? Yes. Motion passed, vote is 4-0. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Dietler and, and your team um, uh, for the, the report. It's always so fun to learn more about um, what we have in San Gabriel. Thank you so much for your support and for the uh, great questions and, and interest. I really appreciate it. All right, Thank so now we'll move on to item four. The historic context statement request for proposal um, and this presentation will be made by management specialist Mark Gallatin. Oh, hello again. I have this next item as well. And uh, as the chair pointed out, this is a 
request for proposals for a historic context statement. I know this is something that the commission has been anticipating for a long time. Uh, it's my pleasure to have worked on it and present it to you tonight. I just want to give you an overview of it. I don't know uh, to what extent the commissioners had an opportunity to read through it uh, before tonight's meeting. Uh, but again, let me cover the high points and talk about those uh, factors that went into it as, as I best understood the assignment to come up with a RFP that will get us a first rate historic uh, context statement, which then will form the foundation for other uh, implementation measures of our ordinance. So the, um, the RFP starts off with an introduction and talks about uh, what the city is looking for. Uh, in this case, a qualified uh, historian and or architectural historian to conduct historic preservation analysis and prepare a historic context statement or HCS for the entire city. And this statement is intended to be used as a basis for completion of a subsequent historic resources survey of the city in the future. Uh, this, of course, would be our first effort at this. Um, and in drafting this RFP, I did a lot of research uh, here locally in the San Gabriel Valley, especially, and uh, took a look at what some of the neighboring cities have done uh, in the last decade in terms of their RFPs for historic context statement and tried to take the best features of those and, and best practices of those and make sure that they were incorporated into this document. So we talked uh, in the first section about our current historic preservation policy and efforts, how we in San Gabriel were a leader in historic preservation 55 years ago uh, when we adopted only the second, uh, we became the second city in LA County to adopt a preservation ordinance. Uh, we traced the development of those efforts through uh, the 60s and 70s, our partnership with the San Gabriel Historical Association, uh, the nice report card that we got from the LA Conservancy back in 2014 and so on. Uh, this section also uh, provides information on our general plan policies that we have in support of preservation. And then we talk a bit about previous surveys that have been done over the course of the last two decades, uh, either windshield surveys that were done in development of our specific plans or uh, in the case of four neighborhoods, uh, surveys that were done by Cal Poly Pomona students as a class project. We also have a paragraph talking about the issue of demolition and neighborhood compatibility, which summarizes the actions that our city took between 2015 and 2017 with uh, both the urgency ordinance and then the permanent ordinance uh, to deal with those issues. Then uh, on page five, we have a table which lists the available resources. These are sort of the foundational documents that somebody preparing an HSC would, um, or HCS, sorry, <laughs> would be uh, relying upon things like our general plan, our preservation ordinance, our zoning map, uh, contacts for the Historical Association, the Ramona Museum of California History, uh, the Mission District specific plan, and the format, the preferred format for historic context statements that's been developed by the Office of Historic Preservation. In section three, we then talk about the project need, both the local setting uh, of our community, what makes it unique, and the regulatory framework that we're working in now with our award-winning preservation ordinance. Uh, this is going to be a team effort, as it's indicated here. This is going to involve not just uh, a consultant team that will draft this. Uh, they're gonna be working closely with this commission, with city staff, city council, uh, the preservation community and the community at large. And I'll talk a bit in a moment or two about uh, what we're asking for in terms of uh, community outreach as part of this process. The Again, one of the things I want to emphasize is the need for the historic context statement to guide our future surveys. You'll see uh, as we talk through some of these things, uh, everything's interrelated, you know, and the, and the historic context survey is sort of the foundation of things uh, to come and makes possible 
things to come that we want to accomplish in San Gabriel, such as a citywide uh, resource survey. So we talk about needs in the context statement, uh, a framework for surveys, as I've said a couple times already, criteria and thresholds. We're talking about evaluation criteria, integrity thresholds, and registration requirements for properties that qualify under each significant contextual theme. We also uh, want to make sure that we're encompassing a broad enough period of San Gabriel history uh, to uh, do justice to the uh, context statement. You know, uh, so many lay people think that our history begins and ends with the mission period. And of course, we know that's not the case. Um, so this survey uh, is intended to look at, or this statement is intended to look at a period from the 1770s when the mission was founded uh, through about 1970. So it includes uh, what's commonly called the mid-century modern era because much of our uh, existing development took place in those years around World War II. Uh, we talk about some other needs that the HSR uh, or the HS, HCS should address. Uh, in other words, how to uh, have a, have a discussion about how to use the document, both from the public standpoint, from the commission standpoint, and from those that will be doing future surveys. Uh, also include an explanation about how to apply the National Register criteria for evaluation. And of course, we want this all in a user-friendly format with lots of graphics and tables and things that, that make it uh, easy on the eye and, and easy to work with. Uh, so, as we talked about, uh, we talked about expectations in that section, and then we get into what we call other information, which is a lot of the, what I would call the fine print uh, that you find in most city RFPs, uh, the legalese stuff, if you will, uh, the city's rights under uh, that, the expectation of performance by the consultant, um, so on and so forth. The next really important part is uh, is the anticipated schedule for the RFP. So <clears throat> when I was drafting this, I was working off an assumption that we should have this ready to go July 1st at the beginning of the fiscal year. We have $40,000 that the uh, city council has generously budgeted for this project and uh, it's already been allocated. And so the schedule that you'll find on page nine of the RFP uh, starts off with issuance of, the, of that RFP on July 1st. Uh, proposals would be due August the 5th. We would conduct interviews the week of August 24th, uh, present it to council, and then have a project kickoff meeting on September 21st. Uh, then <clears throat> once that uh, kickoff meeting takes place and the consultants have their marching orders, they start to do the work of reviewing existing information. Well, of course, uh, have them present to this commission. That's scheduled for October, so we can introduce you to them and we can um, uh, take advantage of your valuable input uh, into this process. And then we're also looking for them to conduct a public workshop or outreach effort sometime in November. They would then prepare an outline uh, followed by a draft document sometime in the late winter, early spring of next year. And of course that would also come before this commission uh, as would the outline. And then we're uh, expecting them to prepare a final document uh, again for presentation to this commission sometime June to August of next year so that we can then take the final document to the city council for adoption in September, 2021, uh, approximately one year from the kickoff of the project. Uh, the next section of the RFP, beginning on page 10, just provides some uh, descriptive information about San Gabriel as a city um, and also some information about our capacity as staff, our budget, and the community development department, and who will be the contact for the consultant. Uh, then we go into scope of services requested on page 11, and this is where uh, the rubber meets the road, you might say. This is where uh, we get very specific with the task and activities that we're expecting the consultant to do. So uh, on page 11, there's nine 
And then there's additional one on page 12 for a total of 10 um, steps or tasks that we would expect them to do to complete this project. I won't go through them one by one. You can certainly read them uh, if you haven't already. But essentially the final project product is gonna be a policy document, which is the historic context statement. And uh, also the outreach and training that's integral to this whole process because we don't want this to be uh, a document that just goes on a shelf and, and nobody uses it. You know, this is intended to be a document that is living and that reflects uh, not just academic research, but also uh, the anecdotal uh, histories provided by members of the community. So we want them, the consultants, to make a concerted effort to really do good outreach with neighborhood groups, uh, local professionals uh, that have a broad spectrum of local knowledge. Uh, we wanna make sure that there is outreach to property owners, to tenants, to the folks in the Spanish speaking community and the Chinese speaking community, um, certain organizations like the Historical Association, and of course, commissioners like yourselves and the city council. Uh, the selected consultant would provide training for staff and the commission on how to utilize the historic context statement in future policy development and project review. And this, uh, this hints a little bit at what's coming next on your agenda, which is our city architect, Dale Brown, talking about the, the process of project review. So I hope you can see how all these things are interrelated from the historic context statement uh, informing uh, the uh, future surveys and informing project review. That's that's how important a document it is. Um, then we go into, you know, deliverables, uh, how many copies of the document, so on like that, uh, what it should look like. Uh, we talk then in part two about proposal requirements, uh, what should be in the proposal. I won't bore you with all that minutia. Uh, and then we talk finally on page 17 about the evaluation process. So what's the criteria that the city plans to use in reviewing these proposals they get in response to the RFP? Well, you've got a series of bullet points there. And as it notes, it's not ranked in any particular order. But some of the things that we would certainly uh, weigh in uh, reviewing these proposals are the experience and qualifications of those who are gonna work on the project, the amount of time key personnel will be involved, <clears throat> the team members' experience and ability to work well with community groups, their references from past work that are relevant to this kind of project, their knowledge of best practices in historic preservation, understanding of the scope of services, a detailed work plan to complete the services, the overall quality of the response to the RFP. We want to know the specific method and techniques, including software, to be employed on the project. Uh, of course, the overall time frame and the ability to stay within that. A demonstrated ability to provide clear and compelling presentations to community members, commission members, and elected officials. A demonstrated ability to deliver reports that exhibit excellent writing quality and use of high quality graphic design. Uh, then of course, their, their presentation during the interview process. And last but not least, the proposed cost estimate. Again, the budget for this project is not to exceed $40,000. So following those uh, interviews, we would then rank the uh, presenters and staff would be making a selection. Uh, the selected teams would be interviewed the week of August 24th, uh, according to our draft schedule. Uh, then we would initiate final contract negotiation and, uh, and a final agreement on a fee. So that essentially is what uh, is contained in the RFP. Again, a lot of material to cover, but I am more than happy to answer any questions that any of the commissioners might have about any part of the document. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so any commissioner questions, comments, or discussion? Um, I'll start again with just calling by name. So Commissioner Acosta, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, more just like discussion points. And um, I mean, I, I was really comforted uh, with 
March reference that this is going to be a living document because as I was going through it, uh, it's exactly what I was thinking. It's, you know, yes, it's a policy document, but I think we have to look at it as a framework and a really um, impactful working tool that's going to help us do what we need to do. Um, so I, I think um, in terms of commentary, the only thing that I would say is that we, we do enter into a little bit more detail that in terms of design, um, maybe opting for um, brevity or infographics or something to really have um, the bidders understand that we want this document to be usable. And like you said, it's exactly what I was thinking, not sit on a shelf because I, you know, in, in, in my day life, we do have to um, try to interpret these volumes and volumes of paper for different developers, for different cities, for different communities. And um, it's actually quite cumbersome when what you want to do is, is be able to have this working um, document uh, and, and really have it be that foundation. Um, so thank you for that. I, I think I would just ask um, that, that there is a little bit more clarity and, and expanding on, on um, that expectation of, of having it be that, that usable tool. And then after that, uh, I, I also wanted to um, mention the part where I have my notes. Uh, oh, the community engagement. I know you mentioned um, that there would be uh, the outreach, and, and I read about that. But even just identifying the types of, of groups, and um, I mean, I, I don't know exactly, is there going to be like a tiered level of different involvement? You know, for example, with uh, the local historic community and then with the city or um, staff, almost like that, that management tier. And then with us, I mean, we need, we need to be aware of as the commission of, um, and, ha and, and enter in maybe a different amount of detail that wouldn't be uh, open for the, for the different, for, for the general public. I, I was also um, glad that you went into obviously um, trying to communicate also with predominantly um, uh, Chinese speakers and Spanish speakers because we want to make sure that we have the community suffering and, and their voice in something that's going to really inform um, the, the rest of, 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 the, of the design and the community life here. So I, I, I was happy that you mentioned that, but I would also then just add a little bit, I think, more detail in, in terms of that. But besides that, I think excited. <laughs> excited that we're moving into this part um, and maybe this is for Matt and, and for Senia but I know that the current schedule um, actually goes a little bit deep into maybe the time of some of our terms and when some of us are being cut off so maybe just addressing some of that and, and how we would um, address that but thank you really really great oh thank thank you those are very helpful comments I know Matt is seriously taking notes and uh, we'll make sure that those are addressed in the final version. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Weeks. I, I, uh, I don't have any um, comments other than to say the, uh, the RFP organization and the content that we just talked about is incredibly thorough and, and Thank you for putting your heart and soul into creating this, and it's uh, it, it's, uh, it's going to be a big benefit as we proceed uh, with this uh, concept statement. So thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mahara. I'd also like to thank you. I think we've anticipated this document since the inception of our commission, and it is exciting to actually see all the hard work that you put into putting this together. I do have a question um, in regards to the scheduling um, and the likelihood that, that we can stay on this schedule because we are kind of excited about running with this. Um, so submission is um, for applicants is right around the corner. And that's, has that started already? Have they been reviewing? Uh, or have we received any? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of it. Did you say commission applicants? No, 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 the submission. Oh, submission. Uh -huh. uh, uh, you're referring in reference to this RFP? Yes. No, the, the RFP has not gone public yet. It has not been issued. Uh, we wanted to bring it to your attention first and get uh, your expertise and knowledge weighing in on it. Uh, so that we can modify it if needed 
uh, before it does hit the street. Right, that would be the July 1st um, date that's on here. Is that correct? correct. Got it. Thank you. Thank you again. I think this is this is a great document and it is um, it has been very much been anticipated. So once again, thanks for for all the work that's gone into this. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I will also echo the jubilation. I think that we all feel that this is finally here. We have we've been asking and pestering and hoping that this would come in each of our meetings. So I'm really delighted to have the RFP. Um, and I think it's very, very well done. I, um, I again, thank you for all of the work that you put into it. Um, I was particularly happy to see an emphasis on sort of that mission to modern um, with a, a look at the mid-century modern. I think that's such an important part of um, our city's history that we've not yet told um, effectively. I did have a question in terms of the resources that you you listed. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason not to include the Valley uh, Boulevard specific plan as another um, resource? No, uh, certainly that. Um, yeah, I don't know how I missed that one, <laughs> but yeah, that would uh, it would make sense to include the Valley Boulevard specific plan uh, because uh, in the preparation of that document, there was a windshield survey done. There was a whole uh, section, I believe, that, that talked about uh, possible historic resources. There was even an incentive or two built into the, into the plan, uh, for example, I think that gave uh, folks that wanted to do addition to their homes uh, a greater lot coverage if they preserved historic features. Of course, that predated our preservation ordinance. So yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I will make sure we add that document. Um, and then my other question was just in terms of some of the neighboring cities that you surveyed. Um, could you share with us which cities that you you did turn to? I would be curious to see um, how their proposal and their their context statements um, turned out. Well, sure. Uh, one of them, of course, was South Pasadena, where I'm a resident. And uh, for those that don't know, I'm also the chair of the Cultural Heritage Commission there. So um, I have a meeting tomorrow night <laughs> of my commission. Uh, and they went through the RFP process about seven years ago, uh, maybe eight now. I think it was in 2014 that theirs was adopted. Very well done. And I know that I found it very useful um, as a commissioner when I review projects uh, that come before the commission or uh, in, in that city, they have what's called chair review where minor projects can come to me as the chair for uh, review and approval. And I, I relied heavily on the historic context statement in uh, formulating and, and analyzing those projects. So uh, South Pasadena was one. Uh, uh, West Hollywood was one. Uh, Monrovia was another one we looked at. Uh, San Luis Obispo was the only non, you know, San Gabriel Valley uh, one that uh, we included in there. I actually have the list here. Make sure I didn't miss anybody. Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. The oh, and Azusa, city of Azusa was the other one. All right. Well, thank you again. I'm delighted to have an RFP. Um, I believe that we have um, time for um, public comments, if there are any. So. Uh, all public comments, again, should there be any, should be emailed to hpcrc public comment at sgch.org. And Assistant Ortiz, have we received any public comments? Uh, no, we have not received public comment for this item. All right. Well, as with others, I'll pause just for a moment with our delay. All right, so it is now 7.45 and the time for public comment on this item is now closed. Um, just one final check with my fellow commissioners. Um, any questions or comments, Commissioner Acosta? Uh, none further, thank you again, Mark. Commissioner Weeks? No further comments on this. All right, and Commissioner Mojaro? 
No further comments. Thank you. So I believe with that, um, just with the comments we've already made, um, you're ready to go forward. Do we need to take action on this? I didn't see that. No, uh, this was just seeking your input and comment on the draft document. So again, I want to thank all the commissioners for uh, your comments that they all are going to improve this document uh, that much more. And um, we look forward to working with you as this process evolves. Again, thank you so much for this. Um, again, I loved Angela cheering in the background. <laughs> it was great. All right. So uh, now on to item five, the building demolition list. And this presentation will be made by a building official, Joe Chen. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Um, Madam Chair, fellow commissioners. Yes, for the record, my name is Joe Chen. I uh, manage the building department. Um, First of all, I'd like to say it's not often us building guys get to participate in commission meetings. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, this item is um, for information only for the commission and also for the public in regards to uh, uh, buildings and structures that have been demolished in our city. Um, as far as to touch up a little bit on the process, the review process uh, before we issue the demolition permit. Um, if I may, I'd like to direct you to a spreadsheet that is in your packet uh, tonight. Um, that is a data that we pull for all the demolition permits that we issue um, <clears throat> for your review. The data is from July 2017, um, and that is the month that we implemented the current permitting system um, all the way up to March 2020. And I believe that is when the inquiry was brought forth to us uh, by the commission. Um, that gave us three plus years of data. Um, staff feels that that is a uh, good enough snapshot, if you will, um, of uh, to kind of examine the demolition activity in our city. And of course, if the commission likes to uh, look into it further, we can certainly do that um, back to a little bit more back to the history. Um, I'd like to note that all the demolition permits that we issue uh, on this list is really to make room for new developments. So that means um, when we receive the demolition application for review, uh, when we forward the application to planning department uh, for the purpose of this commission, uh, it's already gone through um, uh, part of the entitlement review, if you will. Um, there is one exception though, um, and that is a uh, commercial plaza uh, that caught on fire. And it, unfortunately, it was a total loss. Uh, so we issued the demolition really to clean up the site. Um, and again, uh, touch up on the uh, review process. When we receive uh, application to review for demolition, uh, building department would then forward it to the appropriate departments for review. Uh, public Works, for example, uh, would uh, look at it for dust control, uh, for example, uh, erosion control, that sort of thing. And for planning department, um, like I had mentioned earlier, um, all these properties and projects is already kind of part of a entitlement review. Um, the approve the planning department approval. Well, they will not approve for demolition until the development project has reached certain milestones. So that's typically how the demolition permit is issued. Um, it's a brief demolition, uh, brief presentation today. Um, just like to mention lastly, if the commission have any questions uh, in regards to any specific uh, permits that we had issued, uh, just let us know. We'll be more than happy to kind of look at it and uh, give you some background on the permits that we issue. Um, like I said, it's a brief um, presentation. And with that, if are, there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Mr. Chen, um, so are there any commissioner questions, comments? If I have a question regarding one of the uh, the addresses on this list. Sure. That's at uh, 250 South Royal Drive. Um, I believe it was demolished over multi units. Um, is that site? the site where there was a, a water well, I believe. Is that 
is that the site that I believe there's now that that there's now development there? I think it's there is a project there. Yeah, offhand, I believe that is a multi-unit uh, residential project. Let me look up the permit system and tell you. Um, yeah, it was to make room for multiple uh, unit residential units. Um, whether or not there's a water well on that site, uh, we can certainly kind of look through the history and let you know. Thank you. Commissioner Maharo, if, if I can jump in here, uh, I recall from when I previously worked for the city uh, five or so years ago, I think the project you're referring to was actually one block to the east on San Marcos in the 300 block. I apologize, I don't remember the exact address, but I know it was in the 300 block of San Marcos, if I'm correct. I wasn't sure, Thank, thanks for clarifying that. I wasn't sure if it was closer to Mission to Mission Drive, a little right. further up or down by the wash. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Commissioner Acosta or Weeks, do either of you have questions? Yeah, I do, um, Sonia. I think uh, I just wanted some clarity because obviously we've been going through this transition time for, for a while. And um, thank you so much, um, Joe, for giving us uh, the list and putting putting the, 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 the list together for now. But what, what happens from now while we're in this transition period? And if there is another property that comes up, I know that it, it gets forwarded to other departments um, to review, but um, when it gets to that point, like how do we make the assessment of, you know, maybe you shouldn't be, you know, demoing that um, specific property. Sorry, that's my three-year-old. <laughs> and maybe we shouldn't be demoing that property. So how I, I guess, you know, barring that we don't have all the systems in place, I don't want anything to slip through the cracks. And this is something that we've said over and over and over. Um, and I guess I'm just trying to bring it up once again. Right, of course. Um, the uh, following item, I believe, on tonight's agenda would sort of go into further details on what that review is like. And again, um, we do not we do not issue demolition permits um, until uh, it went through the whole review. And again, um, most of the city, or I want to say, you know, all of the permits that we issue is really to make room for new developments. So the application for the site would already have gone through entitlement review. Um, and so that is one way to safeguard um, the, the review process, if you will, to make sure that nothing uh, gets through the cracks. And if, if I could just um, piggyback on what Joe just said, with regards to that entitlement review, speaking you know, from the planning division standpoint, when a project comes before us, or comes to us as a new application, one of the first things that we have to do is determine uh, its CEQA status. Is it exempt from CEQA? Is it a categorical exemption, a statutory exemption, or is it, uh, is it considered a project under CEQA that has to be analyzed through what's called an initial study? An initial study is a checklist uh, with like 21 categories of areas of potential impact. One of those 21 categories is cultural and historic resources. So we have to, um, when a project comes to us, you know, do an evaluation, fill out that checklist, answer some questions about the potential for impacts on a historic resource. Uh, one thing that, you know, is good about CEQA is that it is not limited just to those resources that may or may not be on a um, on an adopted survey. Uh, here's what here's what CEQA says uh, on that matter. Uh, it says the fact that a resource is not listed in or determined to be eligible for listing in the California Register of Historical Resources or is not included in a local register of historical resources or is not deemed significant pursuant to the criteria set forth in the Public Resources Code uh, that the absence of that shall not preclude a lead agency from determining whether the resource may be a historical resource for purposes of this section. So that's, um, that's powerful language because it says, 
uh, even if you have a resource that's not listed on a formally adopted survey, if you have reason to believe and evidence to support it, that it may be historic, uh, you need to assume that it is when you're doing your SQL review. All right. Thank you. That was really clear. Thanks. Commissioner Weeks, did you have questions? Uh, I did, but I think uh, Commissioner Costa raised my concerns about the historical aspect and the discussion we just had with Mark pretty much cleared that up for me. Thank you, Mark. All right, well, so as the instigator of this request, um, I want to thank you again, uh, Mr. Chen, for the, the work you did pulling all of this together. I know that it's it's time consuming to to sort through these records and, and bring them. So your table is very clear. It's, it's helpful to see and to give me a sense of the scope. Um, I agree with you that a lot of my interest in this request dovetails with the next item on our agenda in terms of what triggers the review. And so, uh, and Mark, your, your clarification was also helpful. Um, and I, I want to better understand this process because we do, as commissioners, hear from the community when buildings go down in their neighborhoods or if they see drastic changes taking place. And, um, and it's, it's hard not knowing what the, the process is that has gotten to that point. Um, so when, when somebody comes in with a project, um, are you pulling, um, uh, from the city side, uh, and is it would it be something like the building is more than fifty years old that then triggers a historical review, or is that checklist mark something that goes to every single project that comes in with a request? Well, the the question uh, with every single project is, you know, what is the appropriate level of review under CEQA? So, to give you an example, um, CEQA has about thirty three what are called categorical exemptions which are types of projects where the drafters of the law have determined that uh, the effects are essentially de minimis. They're so small that they couldn't possibly have a significant impact on, on the environment. So for example, <clears throat> certain things like um, accessory buildings, like if someone wanted to do a new garage or something like that, um, it is typically categorically exempt small structures uh, under a certain size are typically categorically exempt. So again, when uh, the project is submitted to the city, we'd look at what the scope of work proposed is, and we would see if it is exempted under CEQA, if it is not. So for example, if it was say a, uh, a seven unit condominium project, uh, that's not something that can be categorically exempted under CEQA, and we would have to begin the process of doing an initial study and looking at all those 21 categories of potential impact. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope it's all right if we can refer sort of back because again, I think that some of the subsequent items overlap with this. Um, so maybe as we hear from uh, the city architect, um, what the process for review is. If, if we can maybe come back and ask questions on, on this, I would appreciate that. Um, is that in terms of protocol? All right, Matt or Mark, somebody can. Yes, Madam Mayor. So uh, we can, this is the next item, of course, is uh, related to this item as well. Mm -hmm. So if, if it's your wish, we can definitely have additional questions for the next item. Okay. Uh, we also uh, still have to allow for public comment if we seek any right. public comment during the meantime. All right. <clears throat> so to that point, um, it is time for public comment. So all public comments should be emailed to hpcrc-publiccomment at sgch.org. And um, Assistant Ortiz, have we received any public comment on this? Uh, no, we have not received public comment on this item. Okay. <clears throat> so it is now eight o'clock. The time for public comment on this item is closed. Um, any further questions or comments from my fellow commissioners? Getting nods, no. All right, so we'll move on to item six, presentation from city's preservation architect. The presentation will be made by city architect Dale Brown. Uh, good 
Good evening, um, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> there, there's been actually, I, maybe just to kind of, you know, link some of these together a little bit, is um, both the RFP that's getting ready to go out, um, some of the comments that Mark made about CEQA and review, and then the discussion of currently how reviews have been done are all really nicely linked together. Um, the one thing I think that's going to be really good about the historic context statement and then a subsequent survey is that it's going to give a lot of additional resources that currently aren't there. And part of what those two documents will do, I think, is help move out of what can be sort of a subjective evaluation and the use of certain criteria into something that's that has more meat to it and the bones are stronger and the reviews can be more meaningful. Um, and so I think that, um, I think our perspective is two things are happening. One on the architectural design side, we're continuing kind of over the last couple of months, we're starting to modify how we're doing those reviews. Uh, traditionally, they were narrative. Um, going over the city's design guidelines or whatever and looking at an application and trying to guide an applicant to it. We're starting to instead actually provide sketches. And we're just, we're trying to, to both reduce the number of reviews that need to happen as well as just be more clear. So that helps. One of the comments that was just made that Mark had made about small projects, you know, maybe it's just a an ADU in a backyard or something is, it's letting us connect something that makes it more compatible. So um, the first, what I'd like to do is just use the PowerPoint. So currently, uh, this is a summary, um, kind of a slimmed down version of uh, the packet information. So our regulatory setting, Mark mentioned CEQA. Um, every city has, um, either, you know, they have preservation ordinances, they have, you know, whatever that, you know, ordinances associated with this. We're obviously looking at if it's on um, a city registry, a national or California register. And then I inserted here um, neighborhood because even though, and Mark mentioned it when he was looking at the CEQA definition of a potential historic or cultural resources, um, it also just has to do with looking at the neighborhood and does that individual project or the site and what may be on that site, how does that fit within the neighborhood? So it's not on a register, it's not listed, but how does what's there have some significance just even contextually? Um, we typically do, um, a, we, we typically start with just a statement of opinion and we do that by going through and um, just pulling uh, building permits. Um, we look at the surveys that do exist in the city. Um, we may go up and, and you know do look at the historic property data file, go up to the Office of Historic Preservation, do some research at the County Assessor or Public Works. Um, libraries, we look at online databases, occasionally pull a Sanborn, you know, map for the area or a series of maps that might tell us something, and then visually review the site and the building. Um, that work has generally resulted in a statement of opinion that, um, that just is, the bottom line is recommending generally that additional work should be done. Um, and so then we go into um, uh, typically the two um, Department of, um, excuse me, um, Parks and Rec, the two DPR forms, we fill those out also and, and generally are attaching those to the statement of opinion. That's kind of where it stopped to date. Um, the only um, preservation report in the city of San Gabriel that we've done was for the nursery site and um, which was 
unfortunately, there was a lot of um, existing fabric that isn't there anymore. Um, a part of just kind of the, the ongoing ne neglect of the site, plus even the original construction. Um, but culturally, it was an important site. And the development of that site and the history of that family um, and the connection with Japanese Americans and everything that happened over the history there was, was important to that site. Um, so one of the things that I do think this will, that, that the activities that you're undertaking and the additional um, documents as well that you're gonna create is, I think from our perspective, we're sort of at a, at a cusp in the city where there's, um, there's additional resources. Um, even just going through the um, historic context statement, the community is gonna be more well-informed. And I think that's one of the things that's needed to happen here is just getting applicants sensitized <laughs> um, to a project and to a potential development and that there needs to be some work done on the historic side. Because I, ju I just don't think that sensitivity is there um, and I think Mark said it earlier that historic preservation is St. Gabriel's mission and maybe the mission district that's about it and the playhouse. So um, I think those are all good things. And I think what we'll see in the future is um, drilling down more on these and just um, not that there hasn't been, but I think just um, a, a more critical eye on how we're doing these reviews. So. Um, be happy to answer any questions related to kind of the process today. Thank you very much, um, Dale. Um, from my fellow commissioners, um, again, I'll, I'll go by name. Um, Commissioner Costa, do you have any questions? No, thank you so much, Dale. Appreciate it. Commissioner Weeks? Uh, no, no questions. You know, I understand. Uh, the, the current process. So thank you for the explanation. No further questions. Commissioner Mohara. No further questions. Thank you. Um, so then Dale, I do have a few questions. Um, in terms yes. of research, when you're working with City of San Gabriel, um, in the absence of a historic context statement and a thorough survey, what are the tools at your disposal in the city? Is it really building permits and that's it? Well, I mean, we've been able to find, we go to um, uh, the historic, I'm sorry, I'm having a brain freeze, the association in the city in, in the cute little house. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We we occasionally have gone to them and been able to find information that they may have. Um, online research, Department of Public Works sometimes has some information. So I, I listed some, you know, probably six or eight or 10 items there um depending on what it is we're evaluating we may not go to all of those but um as, as you all know um you know if you're trying to figure out what the history of some site is sandborn maps are great you know <laughs> and it's just there's so many resources out there that are easily obtain obtainable and that we can um, get a hold of fairly quickly in order to use that but um, the city's been really good about giving us building permits, um, any, any previous planning actions. Um, was there a conditional use permit or something else on the site that may you know, impact what was allowed to be built at some point in time? Um, so, you know, it's just, we just tend to generally go sort of through that list and look at it and then um, make the evaluation after, after that input. Then perhaps you can help me uh, in terms of the the way that I'm I look at things. Um, when you're evaluating evaluating a, a, a project proposal, um, one of my concerns is that context is not given enough weight in that consideration. Um, I feel that even in when we're we're doing a, a nomination or we're trying to move a site forward to to market as historic, oftentimes it's that thread of the the cultural contributions that it makes that, that gets lost, that we tend to focus more on great people, events, or master craftsmen, uh, architects, artists. Um, 
is it appropriate to to bring that level of context into looking at a single site? Um, yeah, and I think, um, Kelly, that question has like 10 threads to it, right? Um, so which ones do we pull here a little bit? Um, to some degree, the context issue we're trying to address even on the architectural side of this. So when we're looking at a project and we're looking at, you know, a part of the city that has one and two story buildings, but the current development standards and the zoning allow a five story building and allows a higher FAR. We're still concerned about that context of mass and scale and maybe even style. If it's so far afield, you know, to what's there, particularly if it's adjacent to um, some buildings that either have been identified or may be considered um, eligible. Um, and, and, and so then there's that sort of um, street block face mass, maybe that just that level or that scale of context. Then there's the neighborhood. And so you have a neighborhood um, like Fairview. Um, that is just, it's really cute. Um, and if anybody's ever seen the video, the, the film of when they were selling the neighborhood and, um, it's just this cute little area and, and new development needs to happen, but it needs to happen within some sort of context of, I think, style and scale, um, to what's there. Um, that's just a really easy one to sort of pick because it's, it's, it's still relatively intact from from when it was built and developed, I should say. Um, I think that it gets a little more difficult when you're on um, Valley Boulevard, South St. Gabriel Boulevard, in areas that really have, you know, for many years didn't really have any development. And now there's, there's large scale development. Um, that's a harder one, I think. Um, to look at from a purely preservation point of view beyond what may be there and does it have, um, you know, should, this should it be a resource that's saved or at least documented. Um, that, that's, a, that's a tough one um, when you get to those areas of, of San Gabriel. I do understand that. I, I am always concerned with massing and scale and sort of character of a neighborhood. Um, but even beyond that, I think, again, one of my concerns in the review process is that, and this may be something that we, we really, in terms of this discussion, want to make sure that we focus on as we work on the historic um, context statement, but pulling out those themes and threads and understanding the populations mm -hmm. that have been in San Gabriel and what particular neighborhoods might mean. And so I think of the barrio um, and the, there's a group now organizing that wants to take more concrete measures to, to preserve or tell the story of that neighborhood. Um, and that's a, a thread that I don't see in many of our, uh, his, our city documents or surveys. And so um, I think the other, one of the other threads we can pull out of my question is just sort of the, the context of the populations that have lived and inhabited in San Gabriel and in those neighborhoods. Um, and so certainly infill is, is part of context, but, um, but also just those, those themes. Um, the, the, the cultural themes. Right. right. Yeah, that really, you know, in all honesty, that really has not been something that's been addressed. Um, again, as um, having read through the RFP and what, you know, listening to the discussion this evening is, I really think the city is going to have a much stronger basis from which to, to review, take action, um, modify or massage, you know, applicants, applications, I should say, and, and development um, than it's ever had. And I think that's one of the difficulties is when you don't have that strong ordinance basis and that strong information, it, it becomes, I think, more difficult to say, you know, it, it's here and help people understand that document and what it means and what its intent is. I would imagine it would also even facilitate discussions about design styles as projects are coming in. Um, yeah, you, you know, it's interesting. I, yeah, I think there, you know, there's, 
there's always that balance between communities where um, uh, I always use the example of the old part of Charleston. You know, you just can't put a really contemporary <laughs> building in the heart of that part of that community. Um, and then there's other cities where a greater mix over time is what creates, you know, a really dynamic city. And, and the problem I think sometimes is even if you're wanting to allow that mix, you're forgetting its context and you can't, and you're, you're, you're forgetting what's that, what's that pedestrian experience like? What's, what, what's it's doing to the block base and to the neighborhood? So sometimes I think, there's contemporary architecture that um, is not of the quality that it can be or should be. And maybe it's okay if it, if it was done well, but um, it takes a skill to do that, I think. I agree. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. That was helpful for understanding the process um, on our side. Yeah. Um, so it's now time for public comments. All public comments should be emailed to hpcrc public comment at sgch.org. And Assistant Ortiz, have we received any public comments? Uh, we have not received any public comment for the SAM. All right. So it is now 8 17 p.m. Time for public comment on this item is now closed. Are there any further questions from my fellow commissioners? Commissioner Costa? Madam, Madam, um, yeah. Madam Chair, um, yeah. I know our city architect here says, are there additional slides you'd like to share with the commission? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm so Dale, do you want to continue with, uh, with some quick picture that you'd like to share with the commission? I think maybe share with the, the audience too. Um, yeah, you know, we got to get to the pretty pictures, right? No, I don't know. Um, no, no, no problem. Um, so we'll, we'll just kind of go through this. Um, we were asked to put together some information on our experience and my experience. Um, so I, I'll maybe just start with a really brief story. I was thinking about this and going, my first preservation project, I'm originally from the Midwest. I grew up in Nebraska. I can admit that. And um, my first project was in Seward, Nebraska, this town of 4,000. And we were converting what was originally a, it was a brick masonry building with wood framing that was originally built as um, uh, for carriages, for horse-drawn carriages, then became part of an auto dealership. And so there were cars there. And then it became part of the uh, big, uh, Big Red Beverage Company. So then they bottled soda pop in there. Sorry, I used pop, I'm from the Midwest originally. And then um, we converted to a restaurant. So that was 1986, and just been doing a variety of projects since then. Um, we are an architectural firm that does preservation work. We um, I don't know if we want to go through the slides real quick. So I guess I'd say go to slide two and we'll just go through these quick. Um, so we do have some hair documentation. We've done them as part as um, specifically as part of projects. We've also done them for city agencies or other owners. So the first one is uh, it's called the NASA aeronautical site, originally an aer uh, aeronautical plane manufacturing facility in Downey. Um, its last life um, was as part of a NASA facility, and if um, Cape Canaveral went down and Houston went down, they controlled everything in space from this facility. Um, really cool. If you go down there, you've got to go down to the museum because they actually have a space shuttle there. Um, so they were going to be tearing part of it down, so we documented um, some of the buildings and then made recommendations on buildings, buildings to retain and their uses associated with new development. Um, the homes, uh, Homestead Museum was just, it was a single family home by someone who was really important um, in the city of industry to uh, the early development of that community. Um, and we've done others. Uh, this is a streamlined version of the packet. So if you wanna go to slide three, Um, historic structure reports. We did some work for Olvera Street. 
Um, we did six buildings down there, historic structure reports as a precursor to identifying the approach to the work for accessibility, some other civil site work, um, some restoration, some rehabilitation. Um, extremely interesting project because it's a, it's a national register site. It's a state park that's managed by the city of LA. So you had everybody there. Um, Hollywood Center was one of two buildings that we did at the Northridge quake for um, National Trust, got a grant to um, look at the damage of the buildings, make a recommendation on the restoration. The other was the Bloor building in LA. Uh, slide three. That was slide three. How about slide four? Sorry, I should put my glasses on, but there's all this reflection. Um, number of National Register properties. Um, uh, the top one is a adaptive reuse um, and addition to um, a property that's part of the Pasadena um, uh, National Register District. Um, we did HABS documentation. Part of it was an old um, gas station. So we documented that, removed it. And then this was called the Labor Temple Building. So this is where the Masons went, uh, was their labor hall. So we integrated that as part of a new building that is for very low income seniors. In Neff Park, La Mirada, we did a um, restoration report for the entire property. The barn um, was not part of the National Register District, it had been excluded. We converted the bar barn to a recreation use and got it re-entered into the, the registry. And if you're familiar with Neff, uh, Wallace Neff, um, he, he was the architect on this home, not for the other two structures that were part of the, the park. Um, and it was, this was for, uh, this is the McNally house, so of uh, Rand McNally. So uh, slide five. Had to have Vincent Lugo Park in there. Um, the fun thing about that is I'm continuing, I'm doing some work currently with, um, David Charlebois, and uh, he's just great to work with. So we're working actually on the image down below. So he's working with us on currently an interim repair of the roof over the auditorium, which um, has 36 leaks. So we're getting that repaired and stabilizing all of that and doing a little bit of work on the inside. And then we're getting ready to start the exterior restoration of the auditorium, including the plaza around it, which they have significant problems all over it. So, um, so we'll be working on the plaster, windows, doors, the cast stone, all the elements there. Uh, next slide. Um, top photograph is Hall C, the exhibition hall. Um, that's right behind the auditorium. So we did a, a restoration plan for it, identified about $5 million worth of work. Um, they gave us a $900,000 budget. So with that, we restored the chandeliers and restored the wall finishes. This is where, if anybody, I wasn't here, um, never went, and I can't ice skate anyway, but this is where the ice skating rink was. And when they took that out, about 80% or more of the entire floor was almost gone. It's a few more years and I think it would have collapsed. So we had to, we had to tear all of it out, tear most of the structure out, replace it with all new members, uh, get the floor put back in, clean up some of the openings. Um, we got a fire sprinkler and alarm detection system in there. And, um, and, and again, just kind of prepped it for more work. Um, so this was the beginning part of the, uh, the rehabilitation of that. Um, the Merrill House was done for um, uh, Heritage Housing Partners. It was for an uh, affordable housing project. Um, it was an early green green. Uh, it, was, it was fascinating to go into there and see their, their early work and just how they put that building together. Um, I've never seen a, I don't know, 50 foot long six by 10 redwood beam, ridge beam, um, until I went there. It was pretty amazing. So we, we did all the work on there. Um, 
slide seven. Renovation, uh, we were the master plan executive architect for Ambassador West, which um, has a bunch of development kind of woven in between a lot of really beautiful old buildings as well as um, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say, gardens and all kinds of things. And I just selected this. This was one of the homes there that we did a little bit of work on the exterior and then we designed a, a garage, a compatible garage that's on the other side of this photograph. Um, this was purchased by a, by a family. Castle Argyle Apartments, um, all the Department of Interior Standards, Section 106 Review, federal funds um, to convert it from what well, was just kind of family housing. Um, one of our nonprofit clients purchased and converted to very low income senior housing. So we did all the work um, for that. Slide eight. Um, Cafe Sevilla, Riverside, it was by the um, UP uh, Depot that's also there just on kind of the west side of town, east side of town, sorry. Um, originally uh, a sales facility for tractors and became a restaurant. And then the Cooper Regional History Museum in Upland was an office building for a citrus, um, citrus company and was converted to a local museum for a nonprofit. Next slide. And occasionally we move things. So this actually, we didn't move the barn. That's the barn at, at Net Park. Um, if you could slide that to the left, you'd see the home that we, in that case, we just picked up and redid a bunch of structure underneath and put it back. But um, the bottom two photographs are two homes at 840 North Oaks in Pasadena. The home on the left was on a site and we picked it up and relocated it slightly on the site. And then the home on the right used to be um, a home down by the Civic Center in Pasadena. And we cut it up into pieces, uh, saved every, every bit of all the exterior elements and all the interior elements. Uh, it's almost done. They numbered and saved every bit of stone on the porch and it's all going back in. The masons are incredible. It's, it's turning out very nicely. And then there's a little bit of new construction behind the two homes. So I think that's the last slide. It's just kind of an overview of things we've done over the years. Well, I so apologize for cutting you off before those pictures. Oh, no, that's fine. They are wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So, oh, um, Matt, please tell me, do I need to go back? Um, I closed public comment, um, cutting it into the middle of that presentation. Do I need to go back to that? Uh, I'll let Erica at least to make sure there are no public comments. There are no public comments. All right, then. Um, are there any further questions or comments from my fellow commissioners? No, I'm seeing a lot of head shaking. No, thank you. All right. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Dale. That was really helpful. All right, so now we're on to item seven, staff items. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, staff would like to mention that uh, at the next um, commission meeting, we'll have the new commissioner, uh, Kyle Hibren, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, he got confirmed by city council last night. So uh, he has a follow-up um, work uh, with the city clerk office regarding the oath of office, a couple of forms that's need to be completed. Um, but we'll get him on board for the next meeting. Would it be a special meeting in September or, re or a regular meeting in September or a special meeting that uh, if we needed to do? So staff would like to mention that. And there are other items staff would like to bring it to commission's attention. So I will start with uh, Mr. Gallatin's uh, mission church remodel update. Thank you, Matt. Um, this is just an update for the commission. Uh, back in early March, uh, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles submitted plans and a scope of work and photographs for proposed interior and exterior preservation work at the San Gabriel Mission and Museum. 
Uh, the scope of work included refurbishing the pews, repairing the uh, white flat plaster walls of the nave and altar, repairing the interior of the baptistry, repairing the exterior doors at the south and east elevations, cleaning and treating the exterior north wall, which had developed some uh, mold issues, replacing uh, previously destroyed hand carved stone scupper at the southeast corner, uh, repairing the windows and entry door at the south elevation, and re roofing of the museum. Um, staff reviewed the scope of work and determined per our ordinance uh, that this could be uh, done through an initial review at an administrative level. So I prepared a memo uh, dated April 1st, which was uh, distributed via email to all the commissioners, you might remember that, in which uh, we uh, document the scope of work and also talk about um, how the scope met the Secretary of the Interior standards for historic properties uh, and the findings that must be made per our ordinance in order to administratively approve a scope of work like that. So uh, that memo was presented to Armin H. Parian, our community development director, and she signed off on it. And again, copies were provided to all the commissioners. Uh, the work is ongoing. Uh, Dale mentioned David Charlebois a minute ago. David is also uh, the person overseeing this preservation work at the mission. Um, he's done a number of preservation projects at the mission over the last 30 years. So you really couldn't have a better person uh, there overseeing the work. So just an update for you on, on that work. Thank you. And I believe I've got the next uh, staff item as well, which is an update on the Hayes House Agreement. Uh, back in 2003, the city signed an agreement with the San Gabriel Historical Association uh, to govern the maintenance and operation of the Hayes House uh, on Broadway, 546 West Broadway. Um, the, just to give you some background, <clears throat> the Hayes House was moved to that site uh, in the early 90s. It originally set at uh, 245 South Pine Street just north of Broadway and was owned for uh, about a century by the Hayes family. Uh, when Mrs. Ruth Hayes was getting up in age, um, she decided that she wanted to bequeath the house and what we refer to now as the jail building, which actually was its original purpose, uh, the small uh, adobe structure that was behind the Hayes house on Pine. Uh, she wanted to bequeath both of those to the Historical Association uh, and gave them permission to move them um, to a, a site where they would function, you know, as, as museum structures, uh, house museum. Uh, and of course, the association was able to do that back in the early 90s. Uh, the city provided the land. So the land uh, where the Hayes House sits belongs to the city, but the house and the jail belong to the association. The Historical Museum, which is immediately east of the Hayes House, uh, actually uh, was used as a um, 20th century building that was used uh, for radio transmissions during World War II. And the owner of the property who was using it for that purpose, sometime after the war, we're trying to determine exactly when, um, sold it or gave it to the city and it, it came under our ownership. So the city owns the museum building uh, next to the Hayes House. In any event, um, what we've done now is over the last six months or so, through uh, conversations with the Historical Association, decided it's, up to, it's time to upgrade and update the agreement uh, that was signed in 2003. So another thing that I've been working on is the uh, is the uh, updated agreement working closely with uh, Pam Pitovich, the president of the Historical Association, as well as with uh, Norma Tavares, who is our deputy city attorney for San Gabriel. And uh, we have a draft agreement uh, that is tentatively scheduled to go to city council on July 7th. And I say tentatively only because the last remaining issue to be resolved is uh, insurance. And this goes back to who owns what buildings. 
And um, what we're trying to find now is documentation from sometime post-1945 when the city acquired the museum building because uh, it's not currently listed on our insurance schedule and we wanna make sure that it's insured and added to the city's schedule so that the uh, association as a nonprofit it is not uh, required to insure a building that they don't own. Uh, they will be required per the terms of the new agreement to provide a, uh, to provide fire insurance on the Hayes house and the jail building. The um, main differences uh, between the old agreement or the present agreement and the proposed one, um, it just goes into greater detail about what general maintenance and repair entails that the association would be responsible for. Um, it, it has some terms of art that uh, have been changed, uh, for instance, uh, substituting the word alterations for renovations so that the terms are consistent with the language in our preservation ordinance. Um, the association would still be responsible for all utilities except water. We've talked about insurance um, and it goes, uh, this new agreement goes into a little greater detail as to the amounts of insurance and the types of insurance. Um, and essentially this new agreement would be in effect for a period of five years uh, as, uh, as stated in the draft. So again, that's um, scheduled to go J July 7th to council and um, we anticipate being able to uh, take it at that date and, and hopefully it is approved and it will uh, supplement or uh, replace the current agreement and be in effect for, for hopefully a long time. Thank you very much, Mark. Are there any questions um, on these updates from Mark Gallatin? Thank you very much, Mark. Um, looks like we have certified local government application. Yes, thank you. Uh, the next item is certified local government application, CLG application. Um, staff have been tried to reach out to the Office of Social Preservation in the state uh, by email and phone. And however, staff has a hard time getting hold of the staff members there. So staff will continue to try to reach uh, the staff over there via phone and, and email multiple channels to get some type of a status, uh, review status, so we can report back to the commission um, the application status. Um, are they accepted? Are they approved? So hopefully, um, if uh, we staff will get, receive any updates, or so what staff will do is provide an email uh, to, the, to the commissions, so at least uh, the commission have a, um, some type of um, stuff update via email if, it's, you know, if our next meeting is uh, in September. And the next item is uh, 162 West Fairview Avenue, which is a, a new uh, proposed a new uh, two-story single-family houses in the village area, which uh, the project went to uh, Design Review Commission back in uh, May 18. And at the conclusion of the um, DRC meeting, the DRC uh, commissioners uh, recommend the applicant, uh, the project architect, also the homeowner, to explore different design options. And one of the design options is to explore a more single story component in the front with two story in the back. So instead of their current design. So uh, at this point, uh, the applicant is working with the property owner to explore different design alternatives and, and possibly resubmit it to the city for review. So you, it looks like you'll take several months of a uh, review by city staff as well by city architect before we bring this item back to design review uh, commission. Thank you for that update. Um, I would like to request if possible to have the 162 West Fairview Avenue project come before our commission. Um, we in uh, our I was trying to remember if we'd had a special meeting in October, I believe we did. Um, 2019, we listed a target list of districts and sites that we wanted to focus on as a commission, and the village was one that we identified as a possible historic district for the city of San Gabriel. And so in that case, um, I would like to ensure that we're not uh, compromising the integrity of the village. Um, so I would like to, to make that request for this project. 
um, to pass by our commission as it's going through development. Uh, as regarding to a historical district, um, in order to to establish a historical district, a historical district, um, there is a section in the municipal code about the, the procedure to establish a historical district. Uh, that includes, uh, for example, a petition by uh, at least 51% of the property owner within that uh, district to submit to the application to this body for consideration for review. And also there'll be other um, survey need to be conformed before uh, staff can bring it to city council for a final adoption of a, of a designated uh, his, historical, historical district. So for this particular item, what staff could do is um, bring a periodic update to the commission. However, this project does not require a historical preservation a commission review. However, staff will bring periodic update to this commission. So uh, the commissioner can be informed of the, the project status. Well, I would appreciate project updates, um, but I'm assuming that they're proposing a full demolition of the site. Uh, and if it is part of the original fabric of the village, then that would put it at being older than 50 years. And so I believe that we can ask for review of that um, under the ordinance um, for the sections on, on demolition. Madam Chair, if I could just maybe make a comment as well. I think this links back to some of the earlier discussion about context. And I know that there's been other projects that have not only had concerns to me about scale or whatever, but about style and looking at styles that are compatible. And so, um, and I know Matt and I and others city have talked about that. And we know this project is, is recycling through a design process. So I do think we'll be, Matt, if I'm accurate and appropriate in saying this, we'll be looking at it probably a little differently than we might have, you know, some months ago. Well, I do think it deserves a more careful look in particular regard to the context. Um, I would also just remind that there was the Cal Poly survey of the village, and that can be a helpful way in terms of looking at an inventory of some of the structures that were there um, to further establish the context. Um, but even the video that you mentioned, Dale, the um, little sales video that was made of the, the village, I think makes a really compelling argument for the planned communities that were part of the growth of Southern California cities. Um, the idea that you would have a complete community that was created and built. And I think the village is a really superb example of that type of planning and architecture and development in Southern California. So I'm alarmed that this project could impact um, particularly because it's on Fairview, that main thoroughfare of the village. Um, so I, I do, at the very least, want to be kept apprised of, of, uh, of it going forward. Are there any other questions or comments from my fellow commissioners on these items? Tanya. Angela? Um, so, uh, Matt, you just mentioned that in order to establish a historical district, we would need a petition by at least 51% of the residents within that district. If we look back um, when we first started very ambitiously to put together this group and um, we went through all the conversations. That was something that came about way, way in the beginning. You know, how great, and just talking aspirationally here, not, not kind of officially, but just how great would it be to be able to designate these zones, these areas, these precincts or districts um, where um, as a historic commission, we would be able to sort of wave that historical flag and to, to go back to a, a previous conversation, you know, provide the community uh, a way of them learning, you know, this happened here, you know, let, let, you know a, a little bit like what Dale said, let me show you about, let me tell you about this video and how cute this video was when they were trying to, to sell all these great homes on, on, on Fairview. So uh, coming as a, 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 as, as a person who also wants to learn, you know, and I, I, I want to be part of that storytelling um, aspect of, of that learning within, within our, you know, awesome historic city. How, how can we go about, um, you know, without putting the onus out on those 51% of the residents? Like, how can the commission then move a little bit forward to be able to designate or at least outline or 
classify some of these areas so that they are determined um, uh, some sort of historical significance, you know, before we get to that point. And I don't know if you could do something pre-determining them as an established historical zone or district. Um, but I, I think that, you know, Sanya raises a really big, big, not even orange flag, it's a red flag. I mean, you have this property that if, you know, if we don't intervene or we are not allowed to intervene um, because of the, the guidelines that are in place, you could very well jeopardize that this will in fact become a historic district, you know, way down the road when we actually get to that point of acquiring signatures or setting up a petition, who even starts the petition. So I just want to put it um, to the commission and, and, and to the rest of us and, and on the record, what can we do again to not let anything fall through those cracks like what we've been saying before? What can we put in place in this interim, um, you know, malleable, period of time so that this, you know, this doesn't happen because yes, we, we have our, our eye on that fair view, but what's happening that, that we're not, you know, we're not privy to. Yes, there's context, yes, there's scale, but if we have something like that, you know, the, the loophole of, well, you know, it, it's not in a historical district. Well, yes, it is. If it is, if you're looking at context and scale adjacencies, yes, it is. Um, it's just not signified officially. So I just wanted to put that up for discussion with um, with the commission. But um, if Senya is, is alarmed, I'm, I'm doubly alarmed as well. And I would appreciate clarification. I believe that one of the things that we can do as a commission is raise districts insights for designation. We don't need to have that request brought to us by a member of the public or in this case, a petition from the inhabitants of a particular district. I know that for a district, we need to make sure that 51% of the buildings are contributing features to that district. Um, uh, and certainly you always would like to have property owners on board, but I, if I understand correctly, we can, as a commission, initiate a nomination process. Yes, Matt, um, if I could um, <clears throat> jump in here while we've been talking, I, I pulled up the ordinance and um, one of the duties in, or powers enumerated in the ordinance for the commission is the ability to recommend the designation and approval of eligible cultural resources for inclusion in the San Gabriel Register and designation and approval of conservation overlay zones. So there is a, um, a function or an authority there uh, to allow you to recommend uh, candidates for the registry. Thank you for that clarification. So I guess I would just harken back to the fact that we have spoken as a commission about the importance of the village as a district in San Gabriel. Uh, we were looking at districts um, that exist and we feel that the south of the city in our previous discussions has not been well represented and that the village is something to speak for. Um, so I will just reiterate that again, that that is a site that as a commission we have brought up in previous meetings. Um, and I'd like that to be acknowledged here again tonight. That um, I do think that there's a high degree of integrity in the village. Um, I think it would be very reasonable to use the survey done by the Cal Poly students um, to look at the DPRs that were done for the buildings in the village. Um, I think that the video that we've referenced multiple times provides a really nice boundary for what that district could be in terms of the original map that was delineated for the village development. Um, so I think we have quite a few tools at our disposal that we can use. Um, I know the Historical Association had a presentation by residents of the village several years ago who were looking to try to find a way to preserve it. Um, so before we um, damage uh, any forward progress towards that, I would like to make sure that we really keep our eye on, on the significance of that part of the city. Yeah, and here, here again, I'm, I'm not familiar with the particular project on Fairview we're talking about, but um, you know, perhaps since it has to go back to Design Review Commission uh, in the next staff report, perhaps there could be a discussion about what we've talked about tonight, the concerns that the um, that your commission has, and maybe uh, again saying this based on my experience with commissions in other cities, uh, maybe there's a mechanism by which the Design Review Commission can say we would like the advice of 
the Historic Preservation Commission on this particular property due to the concerns that have been raised. It's just something to think about as an option. I appreciate that recommendation. Other comments or questions from my fellow commissioners? Well, I just want to reiterate that it's it's going back and looking at minutes of uh, past meetings from this commission. The early meetings mentioned this um, this village as as a designation, and we had um, we had a slow start. We had trainings. We had you know there was we didn't. I don't think we or I personally don't feel like we had the support um, necessarily to move forward with this. I, but it was it was especially important to I think everyone on the commission that this was a designated um, neighborhood and a designated area uh, the village per se but um, so I agree with with Senya and I agree with Angela that that this is this is important and it should be it should be um, documented it, this is something that we wanted we wanted from the beginning Commission, this is uh, Armenia Kaparian, Assistant City Manager, Community Development Director. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to step in and chime in. Uh, first and foremost, this has been definitely a great meeting. I'm, I'm, my apologies, I'm not on video, but I am calling in. Um, I certainly hear the comments, and given, I think, what the ordinance allows, um, I do think that this may be an, an item that we may want to uh agendize on its own um because we're kind of getting a slightly away from this portion of the agenda um i think the interest is there uh definitely there's a lot of resources available my suggestion would be that we agendize a discussion of um fairview or any other district that you may want to explore as a separate item and i i understand that this has been a topic that's been raised previously in commission meetings um, I do want to also mention that, keep in mind, we've been down <laughs> two staff members and uh, we've had to kind of stretch our capacity to be able to move everything along. Um, I would recommend that this particular topic um, have its own time for a detailed discussion where we can maybe get into the specifics of how we can move forward in um, create, creating these districts. Um, and maybe we can spend a lot more time talking about the resources and the things that are there and how we can do some of that. Um, I, I think it needs to be its own item. We're slightly moving away from the discussion um, of the items that are in front of you this evening. I think if we're going to explore this further, um, I certainly would say let's agendize it and let's spend a lot more time going into the specifics of how we move forward with uh, looking at the concept of districts, particularly for Fairview since that seems to be um, the item we're discussing tonight. Thank you. Then yeah, maybe you're paused. Beatrice, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. I can't hear Senya. I can't hear Senya either. Agenda okay. uh, to propose in favor of uh, to have that agenda. Let's see. Back. Senya, you're cutting off. You're able to hear me now. Back. You're able to hear me now. We can't hear you. Now we can. Not yet. Still can't hear you, Senya. Now? You're coming back. And? Are you coming in? Uh, this I is the part of the technology. <laughs> Wondering who started streaming what at my house? <laughs> it is. Uh, so my, my audio is all right now? You're You're back. Let's see. Okay, I'm back. 
Um, I was yeah. just going to say that I would appreciate having this agendized if we're having a special meeting. Um, uh, then that would be fine with me or September. I realize that there is a project that's underway um, and I would hate to be behind the process too much uh, in that regard, because I do think the project on Fairview does have bearing on the idea of the district, um, the village as a district at large. So now Benya, it's just, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, it's Angela. Just to um, clarify that uh, it, it will be on that special meeting of its own before the September. And it's not just fair you, but additional discussion of other possible districts. Um, I would say, uh, my apologies, I'm gonna chime in again. Um, I'm not yet sure as to the timing of when the special meeting will be. Um, my thought would be, and, and please bear with me, we're actually having second round of interviews for our planning manager next week. Uh, we are hoping to have that individual on board uh, sometime in uh, mid-July. I would really like this topic to happen when we have that person on board. Um, I think we can maybe separate the Fairview project and um, I can uh, have an opportunity to discuss that further with staff and figure out as that's going through this process, if there's an opportunity to, to bring that to the commission. Uh, again, I don't know that just yet. I'd like to take a look at that. Um, I would appreciate an opportunity to have the more depth discussion about the concept of districts come back in September. That will give us an opportunity to do some of that research. And um, I know in the past, uh, the chair has shared with me some of her ideas of areas where that concept could be applied. Um, I'd like to maybe have a chance to look at some of that and bring uh, some information that would help stir the discussion. That would be my suggestion that we actually agendize it for the fall meeting um, to give staff an opportunity to pull some of that information and to have our new planning manager on board. I think we can separate uh, the Fairview project from this if, if possible. That's fine with me, but I, I guess I would also then echo the suggestion that uh, Mark Allerton made about including it in the staff report to design review in the event that the project returns to them before our September meeting. I think that's a good idea. All right, thank you. So now 419 Mission Drive. So, Matt, you want me to just jump in? So the project, it was um, a new storefront in one of the retail spaces uh, at the arcade building. It was before the commission in late October of last year. The commission directed staff and ourselves to visit the site and previous to the site visit, asked the owner to carefully remove any obviously not original, you know, material. Um, the applicant, the owner did a great job of that. We went to the site in late January and it was easy to observe what was original and what was not original. Um, it was easy to sort of see the tie in of what, what they added and how they infilled. So you could you could see um, the new sill plates, the framing that was you know more contemporary, um, even the plaster system on the outside, um, the framing and the infill went all the way up to they removed the lay in ceiling part way back, so we could see the original plaster ceiling. We could see where that framing went up to the opening, <clears throat> excuse me, to where that ceiling was, which was the original opening. You could see the original framing above that, that tied out to what was happening on some of the other storefronts because they're not all exactly identical. So, um, uh, and even they'd run some new electrical in there in conduit. So it was like, okay, um, it's, it was pretty easy to tell. So I do think um, our recommendation is that they, we, they're allowed to proceed but I think the current drawings, um, we'd like to propose that they provide additional details. So we can look at both the overall design, the details of every element of that storefront and how it interfaces with what's adjacent and then uh, monitor that during construction. Are there any questions from the commissioners about this? I'm really delighted to hear that you were able to see so much in the, the removal process. So that's, that's great. And I think that what you're proposing sounds reasonable going forward. 
So thank yeah. you. The app, and the outcome was very cooperative. I mean, they were excited. They're, they're ready to move forward and get and I'm sure. it. In, so. <laughs> thank you. All right, so again, um, we have time for public comment. All public comments should be emailed to hpcrc-publiccomment at sgch.org. Um, Assistant Ortiz, have we received any public comments? Uh, we have not received public comment. All right, so it is 9.01 p.m., so I will close public comment. Any further questions, comments, or discussion from my fellow commissioners? Yep. Thank you. Really good meeting today. <laughs> it's been a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now it's for commissioner comments and conference meeting reports. Um, each commissioner may address the commission and public on matters of general information and or concern. Um, this is also the time for commissioners to report on conferences and or meetings they have attended. Um, so Commissioner Acosta, any report? Uh, no, we addressed uh, some of the ones that I had on my list. So thank you. Sure. Commissioner Weeks. Uh, no new comments. I think we covered a lot of the a lot of ground tonight, and it's good to, good to hear this uh, final discussion on the on the village, and then the uh, the Mission Drive project that we discussed before uh, at an earlier meeting. So that's that seems to be going well. So um, no further comments from me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Commissioner Maharo. I agree. We've covered a lot, and I want to thank everyone who's um, contributed to this meeting. Um, Mark, it was wonderful hearing from you and you, your knowledge and what you contributed, and Dale as well. Uh, thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Matt. Right. So I would like to just raise as a, a maybe a discussion item for our September meeting. Um, that we consider um, asking for a liaison from the San Gabriel Historical Association um, to join on our meetings. Um, it would just be somebody who might be able to help inform some of our discussion. Uh, I feel like there's often a lag in terms of communicating between uh, the association and their knowledge. And as they are one of the repositories for um, history in San Gabriel, I thought their insight might be valuable in some of our discussions, um, helping frame um, and give us a little bit um, more specific specificity in terms of things that come up. Um, so I would just maybe propose that we have a discussion about um, the feasibility of that from the staff side. Um, uh, uh, I understand that when you ask for a liaison, part of the challenge is getting somebody who will actually come. Um, but it may be something that if we agendized it, we could have someone from the Historical Association speak to the level of interest on their side. It just seems like it would be a good um, voice um, to help inform some of our discussions. So that was the only item I wanted to raise as maybe a future discussion item. Um, and with that, I think we really have um, run the gamut on this meeting. I, again, will echo what my fellow commissioners have said. Um, thank you uh, to everyone, to Dale Brown, to Mark Gallatin, uh, to Joe Chen. Um, all of the information that you've given us helps us much better understand the process um, in terms of how decisions are made, how things are reviewed. Um, we are still a new commission and we are learning at every meeting. And this was really helpful in understanding uh, the dialogues that are happening and taking place on your daily schedules before they get to our meeting. And so uh, while it's certainly been our longest meeting on record, um, I really want to thank you all for contributing to helping us understand um, what our role is and what our job is and, and how things are happening in the city. So. Thank you everyone for all of the work that you put into this evening's meeting for us. And with that, um, I would like to adjourn the Historic Preservation and Cultural Resource Commission meeting. Um, it is 9.04 p.m. Um, and we will can be uh, 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 adjourned to the regular meeting of the Historic Preservation Meeting, um, Preservation and Cultural Resource Commission. I will someday learn how to say that smoothly. <laughs> how, I will not choke on that. On September 9th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m., it would be wonderful if we could be back at City Hall, but I won't hold my breath. Um, we are not going to be living in a go-to-meeting Zoom world. Um, uh, well, that so with that, um, motion to adjourn. Second. Second.